right, now we're also recording. So, come on. All right, there we go. So, if you're new to coming to an extension class, um, we are a portion of the Colorado State University up in Fort Collins. We're the extending arm of the university, and we bring research, community education, and events to the relevant communities that we serve. So there are 64 counties in Colorado and there are 62 extension offices. We are an equal opportunity provider. We don't discriminate on the basis of disability and we're committed to providing reasonable accommodations. If you ever wanna check out the CSU Principles of Community or the land acknowledgement, you can Google it there. Um, but just keep in mind the land acknowledgement is only for the tribal land up in Fort Collins. It has nothing to do with the rest of the state. So just keep that in mind. So, hi. If you guys want to sign in and then you can each grab a folder. All right, so um, for our introduction outline, so I am Beth Hayes, I'm the Pueblo County Agriculture and Natural Resource um, Coordinator. So I oversee all the ag um, items in Pueblo County and insects falls in that realm. So it falls in my purview. So we're gonna cover um, kind of what you guys are currently seeing. Why are they so high? We'll talk about grasshoppers 101 because that's pretty critical and how you actually control them. Life cycles, species ID, which is also key because not every chemical, organic option, whatever affects every species. So if you don't know what type of grasshoppers you have, you're gonna waste your money. So it's really, really key you do that. Um, then we'll get into our management controls. We'll talk about insect impact caution and then um, we'll do some fall management. So that's our run for the day. So current numbers, um, we're having large thresholds <laughs> right now. There's a lot of them out there. So a lot of you have probably seen, and I will get this close to the camera for those online. Have most of you seen like these little guys? Raise your hands if you're seeing like the tiny ones. Okay, most of you are seeing those. On the camera, hopefully you guys can see these. They're the tiny little grasshopper, the one in the middle. Um, so this one, or the young ones. If you have, how many of you have ones that have actual wings and they're flying away when you step? A few of you? Okay, so you have like a range. All right. So right now, for the tiny ones, those are the babies. They're the newest hatchlings. The older ones that have wings, like this guy, he is a full-fledged adult. Um, and unfortunately, your options are very limited. But there are a few that may work, but we will we will chat about that. Hi. Not Hi. Like interstate. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Um, I will grab y'all a folder. Thank you. Just you guys are fine. <laughs> so um, we're looking at the second and fourth stage right now when they're young like that. So um, they can get worse from year to year if precautions aren't taken in the fall and the early spring. So if you just get rid of the ones or like can try to control the ones this year, um, if you don't do anything in the fall, you're gonna have them just as bad next year in the spring. So take what you learned today and it's a year long process. It's not a one and done option. You have to fight them continuously or they'll just show back up and it'll be worse next year. Um, so they're impacted by precipitation, temperature, and vegetation. Temperature is the most vital one on how bad the year is going to be. So fall conditions is when they lay their eggs and that depends on how well the egg laying goes and then the hatching in the spring. If we have a nice warm spring like we did, we warmed up really fast, they hatch early, they develop quickly. So that gets us um, to kind of what we're seeing. If it's a cooler spring, slower development, slower hatching, less eggs. So a nice cold, cool winter and a cool spring, it's great. It does a lot for the grasshoppers conditions for being low. As far as temp goes, the eggs can survive below five degrees Fahrenheit. So they need wind and they need deep cold for a number of days. I'm talking five to seven days of straight cold. So we did get that really nasty cold snap that all of us got impacted with where it was negative, but that was only for a day or two. It wasn't long enough. <clears throat> so that was the problem is we didn't have the length. That's what we were missing. So that's the other thing that does it. Drought also makes grasshoppers go down, which is nice. But even though in a drought year, like we'll have less, they can still have a bigger impact because our plants are weaker. So it's a give and a take with that one. Rainfall overall, like we've been getting a lot of rain this month, it doesn't really impact them regardless of where they're at in their stage of life. So don't count on the rain to do too much because they just ignore it anyway. So um, I want to play this and see how many of you feel like this is <laughs> like I came to your yard and um, did this video. So you'll see all of that movement are <laughs> <Our> grasshoppers. 
<laughs> I'm seeing a lot of nodding head, right? Yeah. Like this is what you all are seeing. So um, hopefully you guys are seeing different colors, different species, because every species is a different color. They don't all look the same. So if this is what you're seeing, on the end, you all have surveys, and I will make sure um, the folks online, if you can type it in the chat, if you are seeing threshold numbers like this, we have a grasshopper survey gentleman coming Thursday, and I'm taking him next week to count threshold numbers. We have to do that for the state to do something on a large scale. So if you have an infestation like this, I need to know your address, because that way I can call you, I can get you on the schedule, we can come count your grasshoppers. Okay, so just remember on the end, at the end in your survey, for those of you in person, please say, I have an infestation, <laughs> like the video, and give me your address and like a good phone number so that I can get a hold of you and we can set that up and I can have him come out and we can count. Um, for those of you online, if you'll just do the same thing, just put it in the chat, um, just to me, and then um, we can do that as well. So, just important thing. So, these are the maps from last year. So, this kind of explains why we're seeing this. So this first one, the smaller map, this is the nips. These are the baby ones. So on my little tray here, my little fun orange guy is considered a nymph. And I will pass him around because he doesn't have any wings. So if they don't have wings, they're considered a nymph. The minute they have wings, they're an adult. So that's how you difference. So you can see here in Pueblo, um, the darker the color, the worse off it is. <laughs> so you can see a lot of the red is in Pueblo. <laughs> we have a lot of the green, the yellow. Those are the worst colors. Um, and the red is 15 plus um, per density square yard. So that's 15 in a square yard. That's, that's a lot of grasshoppers. Um, I told him I felt those counts were light for last year, and most of you can probably agree. And they did agree with that, so that's why we need to make sure that they count accurately this year, because unfortunately, they won't do something super, super large until next year, they told me. And that I just got off the phone with them. This is the adult graph. So the bigger map is the adult one. Again, the numbers work the same. So you can see how we had way bigger pattern of adults. And for every adult, there's a female who's laying eggs. So, you know, that's, that's a lot of females <laughs> doing a lot of damage. This is the US hazard map of grasshoppers from um, the online from the National Grasshopper Board. So where the red is, is Pueblo, if you didn't know. So we're right in the epicenter <laughs> um, and I have really made it apparent that we need assistance down here. So they are working on some programs. Hopefully we can get out in the next week um, because now is the time when we can catch them in their most vital life stage. So it's critical. All right, so our grasshoppers. So they're related to katydids and crickets. Um, they do actually have a purpose, which a lot of people are like, they don't do anything. They do. Um, they serve as decomposers. They aid in plant growth. And bird, some bird species do really thrive off them. Not a lot of bird species, but some of them do. So the way you can distinguish a grasshopper, so the top is a katydid, that is a cricket, and then below is a grasshopper. So just because it looks like a grasshopper doesn't mean it is. The other thing I'm going to have you guys look, so if you see, oh, he fell down. There's a brown guy on here. He is a leafhopper. He looks a lot like a grasshopper, but the way you tell is they're, they have little bumps and their antennas are below their eyes. So that's how you tell between the leaf hopper and a grasshopper. So if you have leaf hoppers, you can actually control them a lot better than you can grasshoppers because they don't develop the same way. So if you have these, make sure again, you ID what you have because if you they look a lot like a grasshopper. But if you have me come out and count with the survey guy, he's not gonna count your property because it's leaf hoppers, it's not grasshoppers. So be aware of what you have. Females are always larger than males. This is really easy to see on these guys. We caught these ones last year. These are plain lovers grasshoppers. These were here in Pueblo. We caught them off yeah. Highway 96. Yeah. So they are here. I've got calls already that they're coming back again. <laughs> so you can see that this is a female. This is a male. You can see the size difference. They are quite a bit bigger. So, and that's for most um, grasshopper species. And you guys can look at this and pass it down. But they are large um, in size. They're most active during the day. They will feed at night. So if you're thinking about management, Grasshoppers feed the most in the morning when it starts to get between 65 and 70 degrees outside. So right now, because it's been so hot, you know, that's between like seven and like nine ish, depending on where you're at in our county. But it's going to be cooler this week. So after this class, if you go out and you get some of the stuff we talk through, I would tell you watch the temperatures, look at your gauge, see what it's at. You want to hit that 60 to 70 degree window. That's when you're going to kill the most grasshoppers. 
So whatever that time frame is, that's when you got to go and apply stuff. Okay, it's very critical. Um, they don't have nests or territories. They don't actually migrate, so they just move around from food source to food source. That's all they do. So um, they do have predators, and we'll talk about those, um, and we'll get through that. So let me pull this chat bar out of the way so it's not blocking your guys' view. So. Um, in Colorado, we have over 100 plus species in, of grasshoppers alone. I don't expect you to know <clears throat> all of them, but the handouts you have in your packet to help you look at the most common species, which is the ones that I have out that we can actually talk about. Um, there are 11,000 species in the world, so there's a lot of grasshoppers. <laughs> they, like I said, they lay their eggs in the soil late summer, early fall, and they hatch most of the time here March or April, but we had such a warm spring, they were hatching in February this year because it was just so dang warm. So that was probably, that was a problem. <clears throat> so they have three life cycles. They go from an egg to a nip to an adult. So the eggs hatch. They generally, it, it differs per species, but they, um, they go through this molting stage where they get bigger and they develop wings, they get stronger legs, and they do this about four to five times, sometimes six, depending on the species of grasshopper. The biggest thing is you want to try and kill them between the second and fourth stage. And the way you ID this is size and the lack or use of wings. Those are the big key identifiers. If you get to this stage and we're at five or six and it's a full grown adult, you have wings, they're actually able to fly away from you when you step out, you have like three options. <laughs> it's not great. Because what happens is their exoskeleton seals entirely and if you touch any of the big ones, they're hard. They're brittle. Nothing is getting through that. So if you try to do like diatomaceous earth, you're trying to spray it, nothing gets through that shell. You have to get through that exoskeleton to make any kind of impact. And if you're doing baits when they're adults, the problem is, is they have a tar-like substance. If you see it, you guys can pass this around. The black stuff on under this female, that is the tar-like substance in their mouth. It's a defense mechanism. They spit it at birds and other predators because it gums up their beaks and they can't open their beaks, which is why you don't see the birds eating the big guys. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that when they eat bait, that tar is acidic. It basically is a chemical acid. It breaks down everything in their digestive system. So when they're big, when they're an adult, it just it doesn't do anything. So if you have that, you're going to have to come up with something else because it's, it's a very difficult situation when you have those guys. So just be aware of that. All grasshoppers do have that tar-like thing. The amount varies per species and their size because not all of them get as big as the plains lovers do. So that's the big thing. And only adults lay eggs. Grasshoppers only do live one year, so they do die off in the winter, um, but the problem is the eggs. And we'll talk about how do you deal with that. Nope. Sorry, my technology is not wanting to work here. There we go. I'm like, all right, so life, life, side, life stage and species. Knowing what life stage you have and species is key, like I talked about. Um, the development of that wing pad, body length. Um, again, I know nobody likes to really like get up and close and look at these guys, but if you can, that's what's gonna allow you to actually spend your money wisely. So you're just gonna have to be brave, put on some gloves, I promise. The only ones that bite you are the really big ones. And I know this from experience, so. Um, just you gotta be brave and measure them. That's, that's the way to go. So we have main three main subfamilies of grasshoppers here and they are in your different um, handouts. So we have the slant faced, which are the brown green. Um, as babies, they have clear wings. And actually I have a very good example. See if I can hold him. This is a slant faced. So that is a slant faced one. That's what they look like. And I do have a picture. So they have huge heads and they have slanted faces. That's exactly what it sounds like. Spur throated are green. Like if you guys have seen, I don't, I didn't keep a picture of it. The really bright green, small ones. Those are the spur throated ones. So they start out really, really green as babies. And then they will wind up with a spur or a spine looking thing in between their front legs. And that's how you know it's a spur throated one. And then the bang wing, they have bright red or yellow hind wings. So if you see one that flies and it's either red or yellow, that's how you know it's um, the bang winged ones. And the other important part to this is different species eat different types of plants. So 
That's the other thing. Even if you have that huge threshold number where you step out and they're all just going everywhere, not all of them are eating the same thing. And if you get just one chemical, it's probably only going to work on one species that eats a certain type of plant. It's not going to kill them all. So that's the other thing of why you need to be able to figure out which ones you have, because otherwise you're only going to maybe knock one out of these main three. And then, you know, you're, you're a little better off, but not really, right? So here we have a better picture. So here's our slant face guy. Sometimes their legs are blue. Um, I do have a blue-legged grasshopper in here. So, um, thank you. But you guys can see blue. See the blue right there. So it's pretty apparent. It's really easy to see. Um, it's very bright. So. And for those of you online, I will come bring it up to the to the camera. Mm -hmm. Very vibrant. Wow. Very colorful. So if you're a color person and you like grasshoppers, this is great for you. <laughs> they they come in a lot of colors. So they have very nice bright ones. So those are our slant-faced guys. Um, so, and for those of you online, hopefully this shows up on the camera pretty well. If not, I will post pictures, but hopefully that's showing up where you guys can see that on the camera. Um, so we do have one of those that was captured. So our bang-winged, they look like they have dust and dirt on them. They look all like gross. Those ones are bang wing when they're fully grown adults. Um, and then the other pictures are spur throated. And so those bright green ones turn into that as an adult in that tiny little hook there where the arrow is, is that spur. So, um, so the biggest thing is just looking at it and you can also see the spur throated have kind of a red coloring on their um, hind legs. So as an adult or a farther along nymph, that's what they would look like. So just be aware of that. So these are a lot of other ones. Um, we have a lot of the differential ones. The plain lubber ones are the really big guys you guys saw. We have the clear winged ones, um, the green streaked, which isn't too common here. We have a lot of the red legged and the two striped. So um, just kind of, you have a lot of info in front of you. I did that on purpose so that you can sit there and ID them and make sure that you know what you're getting or at least get pretty close to an ID. And there's also an online tool that I'll walk you through how to do that. So if you capture like a handful, I just went out and caught a bag of them. And then I sat there and I picked them all out and figured out what was what. Um, a really easy way because it's really hard to do this when they're alive. <laughs> if you want to do this, um, use a net, your hat, whatever, especially when you have high numbers, put them in a Ziploc bag, toss them in your freezer for two days. That's it. That's all you got to do. Then let them thaw out. They'll keep their color. And then you can look at them. You can see if they have wings. You can look at their legs. You can do all of that. And they stay intact and they don't get gross. So pretty, really easy, simple way. Just warn your family members um, that they're not snacks, that they are bugs. <laughs> um, no one wants to grab that and accidentally eat it. Um, so in the CSU extension grasshopper one, um, that one gives you the different types and then it tells you the comments about it so like the migratory one is damaging to croplands they're very early hatching they're capable of longer flight than some of our other ones our differential grasshopper is um, biggest in our garden areas the two striped are along um, empty lots roadsides other um, undisturbed sites they hatch later in the spring so it kind of tells you a lot about where are they like the clear winged you know they say it's like it's very popular around the steamboat springs area and they really only eat grasses so that's why it's important to know and to actually read through those handouts because they tell you what do they eat when do they hatch and what they look like because that will tell you what to do and how to control them all right so tools to use so you have all your handouts but the other thing is is the grasshoppers of the western united states um, identification technology program also lets you do it on your phone or online. So what you do is after you've not made your nice collection, right, you went out and grabbed quite a few and you're like, there's so much paperwork, don't know, can't see. Just Google this, it pops up and you can click on each one and it will actually tell you and it will show you the different stages, it will show you a female versus a male, it will show you their wings, it will do all of that and it will do measurements as well. So it's a very handy tool. It's open to the public. Anyone can use it. And it's got all of our over 100 species. So even if you find something weird, 
it can idea as far as a grasshopper goes, which is very helpful. So very something helpful to use. Um, afterwards, you will get a PowerPoint, um, a PDF of these slides, I apologize, and this link will be live. It takes you right to this page. So um, you're welcome to take a picture of it, but you also get it in the email that goes out later this week after this class. All right, so let's talk about threshold. So the goal is to have acceptable threshold, not pure eradication, because the reality is everything you'd use for chemicals affects other insects. Unfortunately, you can't get rid of grasshoppers without decimating your other insect populations. And we do have a lot of positive bugs. So a lot of things that you'll use will kill ladybugs, which eat aphids. Um, it will kill roly polies, which are really good at its decomposers. It kills other things. So you can't kill all of them, which I know everyone is always disappointed about, but you have to learn how do I limit the threshold where they're not going to devastate my yard, my garden, my pasture, whatever. So that's kind of where that comes in from. So for large crop areas, they go off an economic threshold, which they determine what is the damage worth more than the money to fix it. The USDA threshold, which we talked about on our maps we saw earlier, is 15 to 20 nymphs or eight to 10 adults per square yard. And that's why they do the different counts of the nymphs and the adults around this time when most of our species have hatched and they're somewhere in that molting stage. So they do two methods. It's a visual count or sweep net, and we'll talk about that. So one female lays around 25 egg pods. In each egg pod, there's four to 40 eggs in a pod. So that's 100 to 200 eggs, a female, and up to 500 eggs, a female. Remember the big map? <laughs> and I showed you the influx of how many we have, and it was over 15 in a square yard. We can say probably half of those are females. And if we go on the high end, that's 500 eggs, right? So that's, and that's in one, one go. She can keep laying 500. So that's how we get to where we're at today. That's why I stress that you have to do something in the fall and you gotta do something in the spring. Don't just worry about now, worry about the fall and worry about the spring because otherwise we're just right back where we started. So if you guys are looking at your plants and I come out and you wanna to talk to the USDA guy or um, I'm also working with the Colorado Department of Ag of trying to put a program together and they want to know your threshold, I need pictures of your plants. I need pictures of the leaf foliage because that will give us how much damage are they causing. So that picture is what shows you the levels of defoliation that's happening from grasshoppers specifically. So I need those pictures. So please send those to me. Um, you'll get my email at the end and also I have business cards if you need that. Um, and you also all got my email in, in the class today as well. But that's the other big thing is um, that's what we need. So now let's get to what everyone's here to talk about is management control. So most of you have probably heard about integrated pest management, um, but if you haven't, it's our nice little triangle here of different ways we can control insects and other issues. So it goes from least to most where chemical is on the very top because we try not to use that a whole bunch because it affects everything biological controls which are parasitic insects that will eat grasshoppers mechanical physical and natural controls decision support such as monitoring forecasting kind of what we're doing now and then prevention which is what can you do in the off seasons to lower that impact which we we've, we've kind of talked about when that should be so you also have to think about your goals do you have an acre is it just your garden you care about is it affecting everything, including your rangeland? Like, what is the actual problem that you're concerned about? Because if you're just like, well, they're everywhere in my property, but if you're not actually trying to grow anything, if you're not trying to raise livestock on it or anything like that, and they're just a nuisance, they will go all away. Um, but if you are really trying to make a garden, they're gonna devastate that. So that is, you have to kind of figure out what is, what is your purpose of them being annoying? So if we think about biological controls, we can do different things. Birds are really big. So if you can encourage more wildlife in your yard, the better. So people have found, especially here in like Pupple West, where a lot of this stuff has been taking well, the more bird feeders you can put out, things like blue jays, gackles, the little finches, all of those love the grasshoppers. And in this young stage that all of you are having, it's easier for them to eat them because there's less tar. So the more birds you can have, the better. So that is a huge, huge thing. Bird houses are always big because birds are having babies still. So it's a nice, easy treat for, for, um, for little baby birds. So that's another good one. And then we have our beneficial insects. So things like robber flies, wasps. I know nobody really likes wasps, but wasps are really, really good for eating grasshoppers. I actually have a paper wasp nest in my yard and I have grasshoppers and my grasshopper count has gone down because of the wasps. They will eat them. 
So it, they are a very big um, predator insect. So maybe leave your wasp nest alone if you can. I know in some cases you can't because it's in a bad spot, but if you can, leave it because they do make a big, they can eat like 10 to 15 per wasp a day. So they can eat them in pretty big numbers. Um, beetles are a good thing. Praying mantis are huge and dragonflies. And it's even though we're like, we don't have a lot of water here, which is weird because the Arkansas is overflowing. But normally when we don't have that problem, dragonflies are hard to attract. But if you can have like a little fountain, you can make just a little bit of water where it's nice and cool. You will have dragonflies who will visit you and they will probably eat a grasshopper or a couple on their way out. So um, pretty easy to invite them into your yard. Then we'll go in insecticides and baits and sprays. Just be careful that some of them can harm pollinators, such as our bees, our hummingbird moths, our butterflies, um, which are now coming out. It can affect other beneficial insects, like I talked about, like our ladybugs or other things. Um, so read the labels and use proper personal protection equipment, and we'll talk about all that. All right, so time to control, like we talked about. Um, younger the better. Adults are very difficult to do. So if you miss that initial growth, like once they get out of the egg, you're aiming again for that third molt cycle um, for the most impact. You can do that before stage, but anything past that, it's gonna kind of be an uphill battle. So we wanna watch for that application timing early in the morning and then watch the heat as this can impact numbers hit. Um, the insect species you're gonna be affecting and the usage directions of sprays, because if you go the spray route, you can't always use them when it's 95 or 105 out. You have to read the label because if you don't use it right, it's not going to work. Read that label. I can't stress that enough because otherwise you're just wasting your money and no one likes them. All right, so let's talk about our options. So we have some organic ones, but because if you are having the levels that you guys saw in the video, I can tell you a lot of these are not working because I've had people call me and say, I've tried all this. It's not working. What do I do? And unfortunately, in these high numbers, there's so many of them that you are killing some, but you're killing like 25%, which if you have that many where you step and it's like the ground is moving beneath you, 25% is nothing. It's not even a dent, right? Um, so just keep that in mind that they do work, but you're going to have to do it in large quantities and keep reapplying. This is not a one and done solution. You have to keep doing it. And just because something says organic, it doesn't mean there's not chemicals in it. It just means it's not man-made. It's not man -made. Cyanide, that's something that's organic. Same thing with arsenic that's found in a lot of our plants. That is technically an organic pesticide. Doesn't mean it's not dangerous, doesn't mean it's not chemicals, just means it wasn't made by humans, okay? So keeping things mowed helps a lot in this young stage. So nips can only travel by walking or hopping. So when they're really young in that first to second stage, even sometimes in the third stage, depending on the species you have, they can't actually hop very far because their legs are not super sturdy. So if you can keep things super mowed and they have to walk and struggle and like the plant life is like really tangled and low, they're not gonna go very far. They're gonna stay where it's easy, they're gonna get tired and it will be very easy for you to spray them because they're all gonna be in one spot instead of like all over your yard. So keeping things mowed is huge. Um, and they will also like, even as if they, if you miss a few and they get wings, they're probably going to go somewhere else because they've learned the hard way that you're going to keep mowing on a regular cycle. So stay up on your mowing. It's huge. <coughs> flower is a really big one. So you want to use white flour that you just get from any store. And then you want to use a sifter or anything that shakes it out into a fine powder is what you want. If you just go out there with a bag and dump it. It's not going to work very well. You got to make it fine. It's the big trick. So you want to put that all over your plants and then around the base. That's the big key, okay? That sticks to their mouths and keeps them from eating. But again, that only works on the young ones. Yeah. Would the flower affect anything else? It can affect, it will affect anything else that's trying to eat your plants. So like if you have aphids, if you have Japanese beetles, if you have ants that are maybe getting in there doing other things, it will actually do that for those as well. Um, but it won't be bad for like ladybugs because they don't eat your plants, they eat the aphids. So if, it, if you get dust on a ladybug, it's, they just shake it off. So it's not, it, that's the nice thing is it's not going to hurt them. So that's the nice thing. The bees, it makes it difficult for them to fly. So if you're going to do the flower, I would say do it at dusk. <clears throat> like if you can, if you can do it early enough in the morning, um, great. And if there's not a lot of flowers where the bees are coming right, like in your garden, then sure. But if you were trying to avoid that, maybe do it more towards dusk when they're headed back to their hive, they're out of the way and you can do that because then the grasshoppers will come back. They'll continue to feed during the night, but you'll get them in the morning too. So yeah, but that's a good, that's a good question. Anytime we get a lot of wind or rain, it's going to blow it off or wash off. So you have to keep reapplying. 
So that's the big trick with flowers. This only works for a couple of days at the moment. <coughs> yeah, to keep, keep reapplying. Neem oil. So it is a natural pesticide, but it will kill pollinators. It's a big, big pollinator killer. So they sell it as oil. You'll see it as sprays. It's a whole thing, which is fine. You can use it. But if you're out there in the middle of the day and the bees are flying and they do sell it in a bottle that connects to your hose and you just go <laughs> anything flying, you killed it. It does, it can impact them on, um, on contact because it stops their growth. So if you get any of those, it will kill them. So just be aware of that. That's why you need to read the label because it tells you when is the optimal time to use that to minimize that risk. So just read that label. Make sure you pay attention to your temperature and time of day if you're going to use that. Don't just be out there spraying stuff like crazy. Um, it's from pressed neem seed, which is why they, um, it's, it's organic. So diatomaceous earth. So um, it's for crawling insects, but remember, if you have the babies, they can't hop and they can't fly very well. They, they have to crawl. So diatomaceous earth works really good if you can get it on the young ones. If they're older and they're actually hopping quite a bit, like you guys saw in the video, like some of them were getting pretty high up there, it's not going to affect them because they have to walk or crawl through it for it to be effective. Um, if you guys touch <coughs> this guy, They don't feel super weird, but if you don't want to touch him, it's fine. <laughs> but if you squeeze him a little bit, just gently. Yes, please don't actually like, completely crush him. <laughs> You'll feel how soft he is. Mm -hmm. And that is vastly different from if you guys all know that grasshoppers are crunchy. Mm -hmm. He is not crunchy. <laughs> he is a perfect example of if you can catch these and you can freeze them and then you touch him, this is one that will get killed by the diatomaceous mm -hmm. earth. So this is another key I, part of why you need to touch it. I don't want to touch it. No, I'm not doing it. It's not bad at all. It's not gooey or anything. It's not super gooey. I can't imagine. You guys can see there's no so when they're squishy like that, the diatomaceous earth is awesome, fantastic. You'll apply it the same way you would with the flower, but the difference is with diatomaceous earth, it can really um, impact people in the air. So you want to like either put a, like a little bit of a mask on or just like make sure you're doing it far away. You're not just sitting there breathing it in. Um, so just be aware of that if you do use diatomaceous earth. So I know that there is food grade diatomaceous earth mm -hmm. too. So if you're doing like your vegetable garden, yes. you need to make sure. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that is a very good point. If you are putting it anywhere that you're going to consume food, you do need to make sure it's food grade. Okay. If not, they do use like different wash sprays you can buy over the counter, like from Walmart and stuff. So if you do accidentally, you just go buy the first di diatomaceous earth you find and you didn't read the label and you just dumped it on your lettuce and you're like, oh crap. You can go get something from Walmart, wherever, and you can just go like on the wash aisle um, where they sell like soaps and stuff and you can spray your produce and it will wash that off. So yeah. So you can use that for flowers. Yes, and you can use it for flowers. You can use it in your grass. Um, it doesn't stick to grass very well. It will go more down in the soil. So just be aware of that, that it doesn't always adhere as well to just regular grass. So just things to things to be aware of. So, um, so there's that. <clears throat> Boric acid comes in a powder form. Um, you can get this at like places that, that sell soil, anything like that. So that's like Ace Hardware, Lowe's, Home Depot, Foxes. Um, you can also get it online from Amazon. So uh, you want to use it the same way. We talked about using the flower and the diatomaceous earth. Um, it is mostly pet safe as well. So it's kind of a nice, easy one to use. So you can get that online if you can't find it locally. The other one is the Kalon clay, used in the same manner as the other ones we've talked about. So that one's another easy one. Um, you can find that at places that also sell soil, different things like that. Um, and you can also get it online. So that's a nice one. And then you can always make a natural bait bucket. Um, so you want to do 10% molasses to 90% water. And then just stir it up. You can do it in a bucket, in a, in a bowl, in a jar, or whatever. And you want to place it around your plants because they're gonna, they can smell that and they're going to dump into it. Once they do, they drown to the viscosity difference between the two. So this does work, but you're going to have to change it out repeatedly because if they get if they make like a whole coating of grasshoppers the other ones that fall in they're just going to land on those and be able to get out they're not going to drown so just you're going to have to watch your bait buckets if you do that and just 
dump and reapply, dump and reapply. So what other bugs fall for that cat food? Some of them might, um, that can have better sense of smell. Um, so you just kind of maybe want to watch that. And you can also do it time of day too. So you can, you guys all know your property, so you can watch when the insect life is most active, um, especially when your most beneficial ones are out and try to avoid that time mm -hmm. and try to hit it when, the, when you know the grasshoppers are so I would do it for maybe that first part of the morning, mm -hmm. um, like maybe take it away right at 11 or noon when it gets real hot and it's going to smell even sweeter because you will have caught quite a few at that point. So um, that, that way be... to like limit the other bees. things. Like the bees. Would the bees them. might. Um, and unfortunately, they're so bad at drowning. <laughs> bees don't do well at all. Um, so yeah, I would be very careful. I would take it away from your hive as much as possible and maybe try to put it in a part of the yard they not normally and move maybe your bee water somewhere else so that they're not as attracting to go over there. So, so you keep your back, like how much, like a gallon of water? It depends on your container, um, but yeah, you can do like a gallon of water to like 10% um, from molasses and you want to do like the liquid kind that's, you know, real thick and sweet smelling. So it just kind of depends if you have a thing that will hold a gallon, if you only have a little bowl, whatever. And it also depends on the size <clears throat> of the grasshopper. Since you guys have the little ones, you can do a smaller container, but if you're seeing the adults, Try to use a bigger container so you can catch more of the big guys. So, just things to think about. All right, so everyone also asks about like essential oils, dish soap, things like that. Dish soap generally doesn't work um, on grasshoppers. So if you see things that like say insect spray, dish soap spray, things like that, it doesn't always work on grasshoppers because again, if you're spraying them and they're in that fourth to third stage, it's not seeping in. That's the problem. And it doesn't kill on contact. So if they can crawl through your wet grass, it's going to rub off. It's not going to seep in. So if you have ones that are like our little squishy guy, yeah, it'll probably work. But if you have anything that's crunchy, don't do it. You're just, it's not going to work. So that's, that's the big difference. Um, lots of people have found some success with doing a high level of mint, eucalyptus, and pepper all mixed together as an essential oil and spraying it on their plants, spraying it on the peppers <clears throat> because they do have such a strong sense of smell. Um, but again, if you are having those high threshold numbers like we saw in the video, unless you have a huge sprayer you're going to attach to your hose and just swath your yard in essential oils, it's not going to make a difference. So just be aware of that. And if you want the dilution for soap sprays, that's what this is here um, that you guys can have. And then if you're going to do anything with oils, there are some plants that are sensitive to it. So just be aware if you have any of these, especially like a lot of us have Douglas fir and junipers, they are sensitive to these oils. So just be aware of that. If you're going to be out there mass spraying, you can also impact your plant life. So just be careful. Okay. So I wouldn't highly recommend it unless you have like a lower threshold amount because otherwise you're not really going to see that much of an impact. So same thing with like the garlic spray. You hear everyone say, oh, do the garlic. Again, if you're seeing that kind of level of impact, they're going to ignore it and come right into your yard. <laughs> and for some species, garlic actually works as an attractant. And so all you're doing is seasoning your yard <laughs> for some of them, so, which they appreciate. They're like, yeah, go for it. Not so great. <laughs> so I wouldn't really encourage that. It's a very common thing you see online and everything. It's, it's, it's not the greatest thing to use. So yeah. Um, again, know your species. Reapply after wind and dust events. Um, unfortunately, there's no silver bullet. You have to reapply. Even if you go the chemical route, you're going to have to reapply. There is no one and done. So what's being done? So um, I have contacted our noxious weed coordinator here. We have a meeting next week to see if there is a way that we could get some of our certified um, applicators to come out onto private land, help you guys spray if you want to do that <clears throat> with the equipment from the county. Like I said, I talked with the USDA APHIS team as well today. Their surveyor is going to be out here next week, so that we will be doing counts. And the color department of ag is also getting enough calls that they are trying to figure something out. So um, I highly encourage you guys to keep calling me, keep sending me pictures, keep sending me videos, let me come out and take video, and keep calling CDA because I can't be, if, I'm, if they're only hearing from me, they just think I'm annoying. So the more people, and they're like, yeah, I went to this grasshopper class taught by extension, they're like, it's Beth. So <laughs> we need to do it. So Beth, stop sending us people. So it, bug them, literally, um, a little bit of a pun, <laughs> bug them about our bugs um, because that's the only way we're going to get help. So that's, that's key. If you guys are property owners that have over 10,000 acres, 
the USDA does have a application process where they will come out and treat it for you and they will cover 33% of the treatment costs, but you have to have over 10,000 acres. Otherwise, they, they don't talk to you. So just keep that in mind. Or if you know friends who like maybe have a lot of rangeland, maybe they have a lot of cows, crops, things like that, they will come out and do that, um, but you have to hit that minimum. So just things to think about. <clears throat> so now we're in the chemicals. So I have to say this, none of the products we're gonna talk about or show are endorsed by the university. It's just for educational purposes. And it's just so you guys can kind of ID things when you go to the stores and you're, you don't know what to buy. Um, so there's, this is not an endorsement of any package, any company, anything like that. <clears throat> it's just so you guys can have it as an educational purpose. So again, remember to ID your species, know your life cycle stage, so you don't go out and just burn your money. So you're gonna read the label because sprays can kill on contact or when they're ingested. Um, they're generally less expensive than dust and baits. And most of them, once they dry, it's safe for <clears throat> people, animals, whatever, to go back into that area, which makes it nice. But sometimes the dust, it's not quite the same because if it brushes on you or it touches an animal, there can be issues. So just be aware of that and then Baits aren't that big of a deal because normally they would have to get down if you put it, you know, where they got it. So just be aware of that. Um, dust are difficult because like when you put it on, like we talked about like the grass, it doesn't stick to grass very well. Grass really works well if you use some kind of spray. It doesn't work well if you do a dust. If you do a bait, it will do well. I wouldn't really say if you're trying to do like a lawn, don't, don't do a dust. You're just, you're going to waste your money. So that's a big thing. So these are the main chemicals that have been proven time and time again that affect all species of grasshoppers and also affects their life cycle. So these are the ones you really wanna pay attention to. So the carbile one is what you find in seven. That's that one. So seven comes in a dust, it comes in a bait and it comes in a spray. So you can get it in a concentrate bottle and you can mix it up yourself. You can get a little hand spray bottle for those in the garden, or you can get one that connects to your hose and just you know kind of nuke your whole yard if you need to do that if it's at that point so um just be aware of that just read the label <laughs> read this one is pretty sensitive to temperature so read that label so that you don't use it and not have an effect the other one that is like a bait is this Corey's bug bait and it is spelled that way so if you want something that's not a liquid you can go that route permethrin is like you can get it in a spray or a bait for a bait option it's that lily milly grasshopper bait um, binephrine is a spray, malathin is a spray, you can get it as a bait um, for the deadline bug bait. If you Google any of these, it'll pop up, it will tell you where you can buy it, whether that's here locally or whether you have to buy it online. So that's kind of nice. Sema spore is a lot like, how many of you have heard of Nola bait? Show of hands. One person? Really? Normally there's quite a few. So Nola bait was like the go-to grasshopper killer. It was this awesome bait that would kill them and also it would affect future generations. So even if you didn't kill the mom that year, her eggs would have issues developing. So you'd actually start a generational impact. However, there was a fire at their um, factory a few years ago. We thought they were gonna get back up and running this year and they have not been able to. So um, unfortunately we have no idea when that's gonna come back on the market or what that will look like as far as quantity goes. So. Um, just be aware of that. So SEMA spore is like the next biggest thing. It's called Echo Brand is the big one. Um, you can buy it online. So I've been telling folks it's from, um, you can get it online pretty easily from, it's called Forestry Dif, uh, Distri Distribution Center. If you put that in and you put Echo Brand, it comes up. You can buy big bags, <laughs> small bags, and they ship it to you. So you can do that. Tractor Supply here in Pueblo did have some. They ran out yesterday. But they told me that they'll get another shipment or should by next week on Tuesday. Um, so they couldn't tell me the quantity, but so if you want to try to wait it out, maybe you have young ones that you feel comfortable waiting on, I wouldn't highly suggest it. Um, then, you know, you can wait. I don't know if the one in Canyon City has any, I didn't call them, but you can also call them or a DNK supplier in Penrose might have it as well. Any other store here in Pueblo that I called, the big R's, everybody, they are also out and they're not sure when they're going to get more. So just things to think about if you're trying to buy locally. It's a little tough because everyone's being affected by it. So um, the way it works is that it's a granular. It's a wheat brown that's infused with the, with the carbile. And what's nice is that if they eat it, they're dead within 18 hours to three days, depending on life size and stage. So it is highly, highly effective, which is nice. And it's minimal risk to pollinators because it's a bait. So our pollinators aren't down on the ground eating little things on the, on the ground. They're on our flowers. So it is nice. It's also pet friendly. So it's, it's a pretty nice one. 
but it's working, so everyone's buying it. So just be aware of that. If you are going to go that route, I tell you to do it sooner rather than later so that you don't get, you try to go look for it and then it's out of stock and you can't find it anywhere. So, um, but like we talked about, our insecticides aren't always selective. You can harm pollinators and preying insects. So just be aware of that. All right, so if you want to think about large acreage, like maybe you just have a lot of rangeland or maybe you just own a lot of property and not just here in Pueblo, but in other areas that are being really affected by this, and you're like, okay, that's great that we have the echo brand or the dust, but I can't go out there and do this on like 5,000 acres and it's under that threshold with the USDA. They have actual recommendations of what you can do at what rate, um, which is nice. And the other thing is, is you can create barriers on larger scales and you can spray every two to three weeks in a yard, I would also say to do that. Um, keep looking at your thresholds. I would like get a spray, do a bait, whatever you're gonna do. Use a week, leave it alone for a week. And then like at the end of that second week, go out, walk around, count, see what it looks like. If it still seems like it's the same number or higher, do it again. That's how you're gonna kind of be able to tell how much you need to apply, okay? Um, because And so that's kind of what you'll do. So Dimelin is the one that the USDA uses. It interferes with the molting process, so they can't get to full adult stage, which is how they reproduce. So if we can stop them before they get to the full adult, it ends their life cycle right then and there, which is nice. It's one of those grasshoppers. Um, and it has to be adjusted, so there's minimal infect on other insects. So those are just things to think about if you have large property. So this is just, it's just an example label. Um, this isn't actually any kind of chemical, but there's just some things you want to keep, keep in mind. So there's always a section on the front that says warning and that says active ingredients. If you guys remember, let me go back, um, that active ingredient is going to have one of these names. Don't buy anything that doesn't have one of these on there. And even, I don't care if there's a grasshopper image on the bottle. It's lying to you. <laughs> it is a marketing scam. Yeah. Don't do it unless they have this ingredient. That is huge. Otherwise, they're, you're just, you're just, you're falling for the scam. So don't do that. <laughs> Um, then they tell you how, how, cautious, how toxic it is, so if it's green, it's mild, if it's yellow, it's moderate, and if it's red, it's highly toxic, but there shouldn't be really anything in the stores that you can buy without a license that would be red, so it'll either be green or yellow. And then um, on the back, generally, or like sometimes you have to open the little flap thing, depending on how they have it set up, there's directions for use, which will tell you the temperature, when you can use it, and how it should be applied and the quantity, which is huge. So you want to read that. And then precautionary statements. This will tell you like the diatomaceous earth. If you breathe a lot of that in, that can affect humans. It will tell you if this impacts your pets, if this impacts a lot of bees, if you are beekeepers, things like that. So you want to read a lot of that. And if you were, for example, I'm going to pick on the diatomaceous earth again, and you got it in your lungs or your eyes or whatever, and you started having a reaction, it's better to know what to do ahead of time then now it's in your face, it's in your mouth, your eyes, you can't breathe, you can't see, and now you're trying to read the bottle, right? So read it ahead of time, just in case something happens, you already know what to do, instead of struggling and then you have to call 911. So just keep that in mind. Um, and that's all on there. So it's pretty easy to see, but just use that so you know how to use it if you're gonna go that route. Even if you do any of those organic ones, read the label. Because remember, just because it's organic, doesn't mean there isn't chemicals in it. All right, so now let's talk about, let's say you went and bought some seven, you did some flower, you still have a lot of numbers um, and you're trying to do that and you're just not maybe a very good bird keeper. So what else can you do? Well, there are some things you can buy. So praying mantis, huge. They will eat everything. Um, you can also encourage them to lay eggs around your property and a lot of them are hatching now and they will eat anything that is roughly their size. So even if you have baby um, praying mantis right now, they'll eat the baby grasshoppers because they can eat them. They're not going to eat the adults until they're bigger because they can't eat something that's bigger than they are. So just something to think about. But you can buy them from Ace Hardware. They are constantly hatching them. I was there just like three days ago and they had like a whole row of them. So I would tell you go to Ace. Um, I haven't seen any at Big R, but Foxes probably has some or you can talk to them about when they'll get a shipment. Usually you can even buy them online around this time of year. So I would look for those. Marigolds um, and roses are the favorite hiding places, if you will, for praying mantis. So if you want them to stick around, because after you bought maybe five cases and then they all hike and go to your neighbors, <laughs> if you give them somewhere they like to live, they will stay. And they will hatch eggs, which is huge. 
So they want shady shrubbery plants. When you release them, put them somewhere where they have somewhere to hide because they're camouflage insect eaters. That's how they like to attack. So give them somewhere where they can do that. Dragonflies are huge. Um, ponds, aquatic plants, things like that. If you can get a little bit of water flow, a little bit of something, they will come hang out eat some grasshoppers and they'll probably, they won't necessarily stay because most of us are pretty dry, but they'll flint in and out and they can definitely help. So that's kind of nice. Wasps, like I said, so yellow jackets and paper wasps are the ones that will specifically go after grasshoppers. So again, if you can leave those, I would do that, especially right now when they are in the early stage. Because the thing is, once you have the bigger adults, the wasps aren't really gonna go after them. They're gonna go after something that's easier that isn't so difficult. So encourage them now because you can always kill the wasp later. <laughs> That's a nice thing, right? You can't deal with one insect, deal with the other one later. So things to think about. Robber flies, which are these guys. This is a robber fly. Um, they will grab a grasshopper and inject it and put their own larvae. It's like the movie Alien. Um, they put their larvae inside, they burst out of the grasshopper. So that's what they do. Um, so they're really good. They really like things that can do that on. Grasshoppers is a great host for them. You can buy them from online stores, a lot of other places, and they stick around. They like marigolds and sunflowers. So again, have some pretty flowers, have some robber flies, they'll cut down on your grasshoppers. So big things. Blister beetles are good, but they also will attack some of your plants. So it's a give and a take with those ones. And then of course, birds and poultry, but as you all know, poultry can also, they're not selective. So they'll also might chomp on your plants while eating grasshoppers. So um, that's a give and a take with that one. All right, fall management. Let's talk about what can we do when the fall comes. So let's say you had the battle, right? Um, you didn't really win the war, but at least you killed some of them. And now the fall is gone. And you're like, okay, how do I make sure this doesn't happen again next year? Reiki. <laughs> so if you guys look on our female here, see how her oviduct is nice and open? This is a male. But you can see that's where all the eggs deposit. So what she does is she goes down to the soil. It's like not even an inch in the soil. It's just like the skin surface of the soil or like right under leaves. That's where they like to put their eggs. So right before we get our first real freeze or a frost, like right around Halloween time for most of us, you want to go out there and you want to rake. You don't have to power rake. You don't have to go out and air rake. You just have to get out there with like a hand rake. Get all of that extra stuff. I'm not telling you you have to bag up all your leaves and your mulch. Just turn it over so it's flipped the other way and is exposed to that cold so it can start up impacting those eggs right away. The more often you can do that, when our temps get below five degrees, the more impact you're gonna have. So watch the weather, get out there with your rake, disturb your yard, let the cold do the work for you. That will be huge in the fall, okay? Um, you wanna have like, don't let things get too overgrown. Um, so watch that spring. I know we like to watch for our native bees, things that live in the soil, things like that. but just know that you're also making a really good home for young grasshoppers to hide. Um, so just give and a take. So maybe you just go in there with a little bit of a weed whacker where you're not going down to the stub, but you're cutting it where it's not you know, super high and you can also limit that. So that's another big thing. Um, if you have poultry of any kind, if you let them out during the winter for like a couple hours into areas you knew were really high infestation areas, they will also, their scratching they do will disturb it enough, they will kick up those eggs. They will throw them out, do that right before the cold, Cold comes, snaps them, done. It's really nice. So again, use the tools you have or borrow somebody's chickens. So it can be useful. All right, so um, bring me your grasshoppers. <laughs> I do collect them. We do use them for state fair and we also um, just use them for educational purposes. Let me know if you are seeing your threshold numbers like we talked about in the video and we'll have time to chat because um, we I purposely make, gave us extra time. And then of course, you guys have surveys in person. Um, for those of you online, I don't think that got sent out, but if you, again, as a reminder for those online, if you um, have those high thresholds, you want me to come out and see with the USDA surveyor, I need address and a phone number to get a hold of you so that I can come out and do that. We do have a Facebook. Um, it's the CSU Extension Public County Ag and Range. We normally put out programs that way. That's how we like alert you, like when we had the swarm and the false chinch bugs that everyone saw. Um, that's kind of how we get the word out. We also have a weekly newsletter that we send out via email on Fridays. Um, so you can always sign up for that as well. This is my contact info. That is my email and my work cell phone. Um, so if something, oh, it cut off. It's 2450, sorry. I don't know why that, I guess it just, it didn't finish typing. 
Um, but you can get a hold of me and you can let me know, especially if like you've tried a lot of this and it's still not working and you think you have, maybe it's a weird looking grasshopper or maybe it's not a grasshopper at all and you're not really sure, let me know, give me a call, send me photos. I can come out, I do that for free and we can chat. So don't be afraid to contact. Um, the next slide just says thank you. So before we do that, um, and those of you online, you can unmute and ask questions. And if we have questions in person, you all can ask them as well. And we can also chat about some of my friends that are up here as well. Yes, sir. How effective is it? We have a pretty small lot, about three acres. Mm -hmm. And there are three acres on either side of us. Three acres on either side of them. And what, how effective is it for me to go out and try to eradicate grass when... <laughs> yeah. So is, are, are they undeveloped lots or... Yeah. Okay, uh, that's a hard part. So you can... Are you out in Pueblo West yeah. or... Okay, so the insect world out in Pueblo West is kind of unique compared to like in town or in Colorado City, anywhere else. I know we talked about the wind, but... <laughs> To help that, um, maybe with a slight breeze of a day, you can encourage things to move onto Cross. that undeveloped area okay. because that is the hard part. And without property permission, you know, you can't just go striking on somebody's land, unfortunately. But maybe you know who owns it. Maybe mm -hmm. give them a call and say, hey, like, I know you don't live here, but this is a real problem and I just need your permission so I can go out there and spray or mow your yard or whatever because it's really bad and it's impacting me so right. try to have that conversation yeah. with the property owner see what they're willing to do and maybe like they don't want that either and maybe they're willing to do it or pay somebody or right. who knows so have that conversation but yeah that is the hard part is that if you're doing everything and your neighbor is doing nothing it's 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 like a money. yeah you're kind of burning money so then you just have to pick strategic areas you want to really focus on and defend for your property and just focus on so that. Does it help to keep a perimeter that's it does. Short? Um yeah, keeping a shorter perimeter and that's even like say you try to get a hold of the people who own it, they never call you back, can't get a hold of it, can't find the right day to, to get out there with the wind. Keep your short because they're gonna go where the food is, which is where it's tall. So you might have to deal with the little babies, mm -hmm. but as they get older, they get stronger, they can fly more or hop better, they're gonna go to where stuff is tall. So they will leave because okay. they'll go for the food source. Mm -hmm. And then just don't tell them it's overgrown. <laughs> Let them deal with it. <laughs> yes, sir. Seven seems to have become a brand name for agricultural chemicals. Mm -hmm. And when you see seven on a container, frequently it's not carburel, it's something else. Yes. Is seven still on the market? Uh, carburel? It is, um, but you do have to read it because you are right. It is. A brand name, not necessarily a chemical name anymore. It used to be, but it is now. Yeah, it is now. Um, so yeah, definitely. I think it's you have to just really read it um, because I know there's different products between like Lowe's, Home Depot. If you go to Walmart, they have different things. So just definitely read that ingredient level. Um, but you can ways. find the carburetor. You there. can, yes, and you can even like type it in when you Google search, um, and so that way you can find the specific one you want. So that way you don't have to like go all over town um, because if you just call Walmart and say, do you have seven? Like, oh yeah, but course, they, they, yeah. they don't know what to look for. Now, so. If you can get a carburetor, you can make bait. Yes. Yeah, because they but do use it as a bait form. I'm not sure if any of these other insecticides would work. Uh, the molasses is apparently the attractor. It is, yep. Yeah, so it, it depends, um, and it depends, again, where you're at with live stage and species. So it's kind of a know what you have, plan your attack from there kind of deal. And my son, who keeps bees, mm -hmm. <clears throat> says he can feed the bees with sugar water, mm -hmm. and they will prefer the sugar water to the molasses. Mm -hmm. And so you can keep them out of your bait yes by feeding them what they would rather have at the same time yes yeah and um i sit on the board of the local beekeepers association and this time of year you shouldn't really be feeding your bees they should be out foraging at a pretty high level unless there's something wrong with your hive um but yeah so i would yeah if you have bees or you're new to bees i would encourage you to do that or also join the beekeeper association because they can give you tips on maybe what to switch your hives to so that you can do the bait and the bees aren't as likely to go be impacted. So, yeah. 
So I have a lot of <clears throat> tall grass that I haven't had time to mow. Mm -hmm. and I left it there because I thought, well, that will keep all the grasshoppers there and away from my <clears throat> fruit trees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's not, you know, exactly true. And I think if you have fruit trees, I can probably smell them. So yeah. that's probably why. I know there was one little peach that had little like bite marks in it. Ah, yeah. Um, I think I was on some Facebook page and you had mentioned something about copper. There have been, so in, I did an earlier class of this in April and people had found last year on some folks, I, I've looked and looked and looked, I can't find a case study, so I can't tell you the science behind it, but people said that they found success doing little stakes of copper, like a, a roll, the copper piping, and doing that every like two inches or so around like their garden bed and it was keeping the grasshoppers out. Um, copper, if they ingest it, they don't like it generally, but I don't know, they're not able to eat the pipes. So I don't know what the effect is and there isn't like a public case study I've been able to find why that's effective. Um, but a lot of folks did bring that up. So something to try, I can't tell you why it works, um, but why not give it a try? Because it's, you know, better than not, right? So yeah, so that was seeming to be a popular method people were finding that was working, so. Do you think like copper utensils would work as well as something? It might. It's worth a try, but it may not be dense enough. So it sounded like it had to be the actual like pipes. Plumbing. Yeah, like the plumbing stuff. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know anyone wants to steal it. Right, yeah. <laughs> and like then you'll have the people coming and like stealing all this copper that's in your yard. <laughs> Can't win. <laughs> but, but yeah, so that that was something a lot of folks told me about. Um it's worth a try. I don't, I have like, I'm encouraging the university to let me do a case study. So if some of you guys have really big yards and you have that, try it and let me know. Or talk to me about it. We can set up a, a research project on your grasshoppers um, that's funded by the university. And we can see if it works. And then we can figure out why it works and how effective it is. I found a few pieces after I read that and kind of hung them on, on the tree, mm -hmm. around the tree. So. It might work. Let me know. It'll be interesting to see if that affects them or not. Yeah, because I, I don't know if it has to do with like the ground vibration or I'm not sure. So yeah, let me know how that works with the tree. Sure. Yeah. Sorry, your hand up, sir. Is this like a, a, a mass of grasshoppers this season? Mm -hmm. Last season was the same way, I understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, is this like the cicada outbreak or is this something that's just it up and it's just headed no up. It, it has a lot to do with the climate shift um, that's been happening. That's kind of what's driving it. And that's also why we had like that huge explosion of false chinch bugs. It's just the weather is changing on such a large scale. We're seeing a bigger impact on our insects, unfortunately. So um, it's not necessarily something like Pueblo County is doing or Colorado mm -hmm. is doing. It's just it's the entire planet is mm -hmm. having a, a climate shift and therefore the bugs are filling it and they're responding to it. So, yeah, but there has been, an, unfortunately, we don't, we have not had, and I talked about locusts in April, but just so you all know, locusts and grasshoppers are not the same thing. Any, gra most, some grasshoppers can become locusts, but not all locusts are grasshoppers. Um, so it's actually a metaphorical change where they, they're mostly solitary critters. They don't really hang out together unless it's mating season. Um, when they become locusts, what happens is they all get together, they vibrate at a certain intensity, and it changes their DNA, and they become a different insect entirely. They actually change, they get bigger wings, longer, they get more aggressive, and they actually move together as one entity instead of solitary. So they're actually different insects. They're not grasshoppers anymore. We've not had any in the United States in the last the last outbreak in my thing from April was like 1970 um, and they um, called out the National Guard in Colorado Springs and were nuking and like had flamethrowers out on the streets because it was bad. I had pictures. Um, there's a documentary on it if you want to watch it. It's pretty interesting. Um, but it was really bad and um, they had flamethrowers out like on the range on horseback trying to just like save stuff for cattle. It was intense. They built like seven foot high fences to keep them out and on the other side it looked like you know the zombies were it was like that but grasshoppers um it was really bad they've not had any here but there's been really bad cases in mexico the last few years and they keep getting closer to the border every year so it's only a matter of time until they cross the border and um 
<laughs> They're here. Do they need a locus to come over and teach them how to do that, to do it, or what? Um, they kind of do because there has to, like, the grasshoppers generally won't do it here, like, they're not the right species, but if the ones from Mexico do get in here and they get in our populations, and, like, if one overwinters and lays eggs, those eggs will hatch, and it could really start something nasty, so, and they can migrate, they, they will, um, and it's been, in the last infestation, it went from Texas all the way to Montana, and it blotted out the western United States um, for a year, so, yeah. So if they come, it's really bad <laughs> for everybody. So um, yeah, so Texas A&M does is the one that tracks all that. So they are watching that very closely, and they're right there. Um, so they have been sending out warnings of things to watch out for um, and like species to look for. So if you see something that looks really really weird, like and you're like it's not a leaf hopper, and I don't know if it's grasshopper, call me because. I need to know. <laughs> um, maybe it hopped a hopped on somebody's car and um, took a ride and wound up in Colorado. So the sooner I know, the better. Yes, sir. As near as I can, <coughs> excuse me. As near as I can tell, some of these grasshoppers are still hatching. Yes. Some of them are still hatching. All different sizes. Mm -hmm. How long are they going to continue? It depends on how much moisture we get this month um, and the temperature. Like it's going to get cool pretty soon here. Um, I think tomorrow it's supposed to be the highest ever five. So it's going to get nice and cool, which is really, it's perfect hatching weather for grasshoppers. <laughs> so, uh, I know, I was like, oh, like, no, it's worse. I thought we were going in a better place than that. <laughs> no, so, um, we actually, yeah, sorry. We need it to heat back up. The faster we get back to our normal Pueblo heat where we're all sitting sweating um, and 80 feels cold to us, that's better. Um, so we need the heat to come back with a vengeance, um, but they will keep hatching for another two to three weeks if we don't get our heat back. So, yeah, instead of a rain dance, maybe do a sun dance because we need it mm -hmm. desperately. Any reason, uh, aside from expense, not to use, I was thinking of fruit trees um, because last year they stripped everything and this year they're well on their way. Uh, nets? Nets will work, um, but it works well for the young ones. When they get big, they will eat through them. They'll eat through the nets. Yes. <laughs> Did not know that. So it works if you're going to do that and then do some kind of control method. Um, great. But just in and of itself, if, it's not Yeah, if you do right. just a net, you will find holes. That's they will crazy. eat through it. That tar yeah. will burn right through that. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a nasty thing. <clears throat> so <laughs> I had put some little bait stations. I was trying to make my own yellow little bait. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I went and bought the seven dust mm -hmm. and then I bought some oat bran because I didn't have wheat bran <laughs> and wheat germ and mm -hmm. I mixed it all up and I put them in some buckets mm -hmm. and I laid them on their side and stuff like that. So I felt like they were somewhat effective but does a seven dust with the heat does that dissipate the effectiveness? It does, yeah. And so, then does it also affect like if I were to get um, the praying mantis, I mean, will they also feed on that? They won't because they're only going to feed, they only exclusively are predator bugs. So they'll only, they don't eat bait or anything. They will only pick up another bug and eat it. So, um, yeah, you might affect a few other things that accidentally fall into the bait. But, I mean, it, it should be pretty minimal as far as the population impact goes on everything else. Yeah, because I just put it... Know, on the side and mm -hmm. kind of leave it up and open. Yeah, so yeah, I would think your impact's probably minimal with that. Um, and I'd be curious to see how many you kill. So. I see a lot of, in, I don't know if it's their poop mm -hmm. or not, you know, and that I, at some point I thought it was like mouse poop, but mm -hmm. I wasn't sure. Yeah. Because it, it looks similar. Yeah, oh, that's very interesting. Maybe please write down your address. So. <laughs> I want to come see. So, yeah, I will have to keep note of that. So, yes, ma'am. When you apply bait, do you just apply it around the perimeter, or do you put it all over the place? You can put it all over, um, and you just like if you have like dogs, cats, anything that's gonna get out there, you just want to read like if it's gonna be super toxic for them or at like what level, cause some of them, like the seven bait, they'd have to eat like a ton of it, like a lot, they'd have to get like into a whole bag for it to affect them. But you know, so just be aware of that. Like you can spread that like a lot farther. Just be aware if you have things like that or maybe you have young children, grandchildren that are out there that will put anything in their mouth. Um, 
Chickens, you want to be a little careful. I would not put any chemicals um, around that because since chickens are so small, it doesn't take much to kill them. Yeah. So, and unfortunately, like unless you catch it really rapidly, you're just going to wind up with dead chickens. So, yeah. yes, ma'am. Are there any plants that the grasshoppers don't eat? No. <laughs> yeah, um, they because a lot of folks have asked that and they're like in smaller numbers, they won't always eat like irises and other things. This year, um, they're eating everything. I mean, I haven't heard from anybody that they're like, they're not on this one bush, they're eating Russian sage, they're eating thistle, they're eating, they're eating everything and anything they can get in their mouth. So nothing is safe. Yeah, in smaller numbers, they will avoid certain plants, they'll be a bit more selective, but in the quantities we're saying, it's it's a frenzy of feeding, so nothing is safe. Some of the cactus seem to be immune to them. Yeah, and I think it's it's too tough for them to chew through, but oh, that's because the, like yeah, they make a barrier and I think the skin is tough, but that's because most of our grasshoppers are also still young. So as they mature, we might see some of the choyas get being eaten because their mouths are getting bigger. So yeah. This is the first year that my wife plants marigolds every year to keep her on the card. It does, and it's been pretty effective till this year. Mm -hmm. yeah. But they, uh, this is the first time I've ever seen them eat onions to the ground. Yeah, they have been prolific on like everything. So yeah, that's why like doing some of those beneficial plants, it works. But if it's in high enough numbers, they'll just yeah. mow past it. And, like it's not. Even I did enough. employ one of the National Guard's deals though. Did you? We have, <laughs> seems like about every week or so we'll have a new hatch mm. and so i take my weed burner I was thinking about that. you're a little careful with it. it's pretty effective yeah um, i mean i i know somebody who was so sick and tired of them she was out there with like the trimmers like a plant trimmer and was just out there <laughs> <laughs> and she she knocked quite a few of them down so i mean if you are seeing them in that quantity i mean they don't care i was spring i haven't i put up a new fence mm -hmm. and i was treating it mm -hmm. and they, they were just sitting on the top, like watching me. You yeah, know, they didn't they even like fly off. Don't or, care. Yeah. yeah. Like, what are you so, doing? so maybe if you have a riding lawn mower or like a push mower, and they're at the stage where they can hop pretty good, I would speed that up as fast as you can go, and I would knock a lot of them out because those blades will cut them it's at that stage. So, so. <laughs> um, you know, so cut them down. <laughs> Mow them down. Any so questions? If Sorry. You were, if yeah. you were trying to do a vegetable garden. Would you go like the flower route, the diatomaceous earth route? What would you even? So do? I can tell you <clears throat> my garden personally, um, and I also have chickens, but they're separate from the garden area. Um, so I've been doing the flower and the diatomaceous earth. That seems to be doing pretty well. Um, but I have a lot of wildlife birds that are also that I purposely have continued to feed. So they've been doing a good job on keeping my population low. So I've had good success with that. I've not had to go to a chemical yet. Um, but I've also only had the very, very small babies, and I have done everything I can to kill those without mercy, so they can't get older. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what I've been doing. Um, in my chicken area, I have seen them getting on my mint and eating them, um, but my chickens are also going through and eating those, and I've left, that's where my wasp nest is, and I've seen so many wasps carrying grasshoppers. Really? Yeah, oh, wow. so I have seen a great benefit, and the wasps are like so busy, I've never got stung this year. Because there's like there's so much food. <laughs> I'm like, great. So I'm like, kill you later. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm like, you're cool until let me do it. So yeah. So it's it's been interesting. So yeah, I've done that because I also try to stay away from the chemicals. But I mean if it gets bad enough, I will buckle down. <laughs> I can almost see what they prefer to eat in the garden. Yeah. And so far, they've left a few things alone, and now I'm seeing them. I go out and it's like, oh, well, look at you. Yeah, <laughs> once they eat their favorites, then it's just game yeah, on. Yeah, that's what it looks like. like. So, yeah. Any questions from the folks online? You can unmute because I apologize. I've not been checking the chat, but you are welcome to unmute. Can I make sure I didn't see anything. Oh, geez. Ah. Yeah, hi, Beth. Um, this is Carol Ann. Um, hey, uh, yeah, I was just um, using, trying a cayenne and um, garlic spray, but obviously you have been tracking them. Um, what about just like a strong cayenne spray? Does that do anything? 
Um, it's supposed to. Um, a lot of research says they don't like it, that it bothers their mouth receptors, but again, you have to do it in such quantity if you have the thresholds we're having in most places. Otherwise, they it'll affect like 10 of them and the others will just breeze past it because then those 10 ate it all and it doesn't affect the rest. So um, if you have a huge jug of it um, that you can reapply all the time, yes, but otherwise it's, it's not super effective. I see there's a few other questions. You guys are welcome to ask them or you can type them in the chat because I'm watching the chat now. Beth, I have another question. Um, on the sprays, um, chemical sprays, which I've never thought of using, but maybe at this point I might think about it. Um, you said on the bottle, what do you need to make sure was on the bottle to for safety or you made a comment and I, I didn't catch that. Yes, um, let me go back to that slide. So here, um, so where it says, um, so the big things you want to pay attention to, Caroline, is where it says active ingredient. Um, so I'm going to see if I can move my mouse here. Um, so here where it says active ingredient, that's the big thing you want to watch for um, because as it was pointed out here in the in-person option, if, it's, if, it, if you just go out and buy seven but it doesn't actually have that active ingredient, it's not going to bother the grasshoppers. It's just a name brand. It's not the actual chemical you need. So there's, there's that one. And then um, the toxicity level is here where it will be right where it says read cautions on back and those words will be in different colors. So caution, mildly toxic will be green. And then anything else will be yellow because they won't sell the stuff in red in stores unless you have a, a pesticide applicator license. So, um, and then, yeah. And then anything else, you'll just want to read like the precautionary statements, I'm trying to get my mouth back, which should be, they'll be on the back or on the little pull apart um, flip piece uh, if it's a bottle. And you'll just want to read that in case, um, like diatomaceous earth can irritate your lungs, your eyes, stuff like that. So if, if it if it can be a little irritant to you, you just kind of want to know that. So you know, like whether you need to wear a mask, maybe you need to wear gloves or long sleeves or something like that. You just want to read that before you use it. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, any other questions? Yes, I will be sending out the PowerPoint. Um, the handouts were sent out via email, but if you guys didn't get them, um, you can let us know and we can resend them. There were quite a few, but I wanted to give you guys a lot of options for control methods. But yes, the PowerPoint will be sent out um, and so will the recorded link of this. So if you forgot something, you didn't write it down, you can rewatch this um, and you can just go back and pause and do whatever you need to. So, um, yep. Anything else? All right, hearing nothing, you all are free to go. You're welcome to come out and check out the bugs. Um, the last thing, I guess, really quick, we do not have these here. So if you hear the hype on social media, they're not here in Pueblo. They are in Moffat and Route County um, and higher up in like Rio Blanco, which is northwest of us. So, um, but these guys are Mormon crickets and they're really bad. <laughs> and they will, they will block off highways and they have to keep rolling semis through to plow through them. So thankfully we don't have any here in Pueblo, but they are here in Colorado. So if you hear of it, it is another big thing they're looking at dealing with. There are, they are in high numbers again this year. They were in last year, but we do not have any here in Pueblo. Doesn't mean they can't be here though. So if you see something crawling around that looks like that, um, let me know because that would be also a new who thing that a lot of the state officials would like to know. So um, just look at those and for those of you online, let me make sure the camera is looking at. Uh, yeah. All right. So, whoop, too low. So that is the Mormon cricket for those of you online. That's what it looks like. So if you see that, uh, I need to know. So, all right. Well, thank you all. Appreciate it. And um, you. you can go out the same way you came in. For those of you online, you can hop off. Um, you get everything via email. And let me know if you have questions. I need your surveys, so if you can just leave them on the table over here. Um, for those of you in person, that would be great.
Thank you.